Because reading is one of the most complex tasks that we probably, one of the most challenging tasks, because um, after all, when you read a, a text, um, you, have, you need to concentrate. The brain needs to process individual words and sentences, but there's a lot of clutter in the world, right? Even normally, uh, the way, well, visual attention resources are very important to be able to focus on something that's really, really of interest. Right? So we need to blot out everything else and, pro and process one thing. And the brain can actually process only one thing at a time. It's, um, it, it cannot really multitask, which is a myth. Right? So, um, but reading, you need to look at the individual letters and then put them together to form a word. And there are so many letters on the page. So it is essentially a challenging visual task. Um, and of course, the major theories about uh, reading and dyslexia, say, is um, they were concentrated largely on what's called a phonological uh, um, um, theory. Where, because when you, long before you start learning to read, uh, you have actually heard all those words, many of those words already. So you have an auditory memory for words. So when you read, very often, most often what you do is that you convert the individual alphabets to its corresponding phonemes, sounds, and you sound out the letters, and you put them together, and you can, and you look up your auditory memory, not look up, um, yeah, in a way, look up your auditory memory, and then, and then, and then read it aloud. Um, but there have been, the, the, main, the mainstream idea for a long time has been that the issue is a phonological problem, where you are not able to um, uh, um, find the correct phonemic equivalent and then, and then read it out. Um, however, there's so many steps in the visual processing before you come to the stage. Um, and one of the most uh, important and challenging tasks for the brain is to be able to concentrate on the individual letters, to be able in, in, the, in, the, in the whole uh, you know, vast array of all the visual inputs coming in. Right? So uh, the brain has a mechanism of doing that, which is um, uh, called visual spatial attention, where there are top-down signals which are coming down from higher areas. For example, if you take this brain here, the visual area is right at the back. That is where, that is where the visual input is coming in from the eyes. And then it, it tends to go through two, two, two pathways. There's a, there's a dorsal stream which goes to the, this area here. Dorsal means up, higher. And the ventral stream which goes down here. The ventral stream is the one which actually identifies the individual letters and puts them together into a word. But the ventral stream cannot really do that because um, uh, uh, those, those cells there, we have the recording from cells in monkeys and cats, those cells have quite a large receptive fields. I mean, you can put the letter wherever you like, it'd still be able to, the, 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 the unit would fire. That's because you should be able to identify the letter, it doesn't matter where it is. So you need to concentrate on those individual letters somehow. But for that, the dorsal stream actually here, um, the theory is that it sends signals back, a kind of a top-down signal, which, with which you're able to focus on one thing. When you're driving a car, you should focus on the road. You should not be distracted by all the things around. So actually, there's a top-down signal which help you to focus on one thing at a time. Right? And these signals are able to pick up one or two letters at a time and then sweep it across so that you put all these word letters together and identify the word. Right? And these identification happens here, but these areas are very important. Where the, where the, the, actually there are fast fibers called the magma cellular pathway. They take signals very fast and they can go back sufficiently uh, early enough to be able to affect the slower fibers uh, which take in detailed information about, about letters. And All right, so this kind of um, interaction between this area is very important. This is a quite a challenging task, especially considering the small letters, small print and, uh, that, we, uh, that we managed to read. And, and so um, uh, uh, long back, about 20 years ago, when I wasn't working on dyslexia at all at that time, I, my main area is actually understanding how the visual, power, visual system works, while the visual processing is, is done by the various different parts of the brain, and mainly I record from single nerve cells and monkeys and cats. I do some work on humans as well. As well. At that time, then, I quite serendipitously, I, I thought of the idea that probably in reading, 
if this, this kind of visual attentional mechanism is very important, then it may well be that this is what is affected in developmental dyslexia. So, um, uh, so I, I mean, I didn't know much about the dyslexia literature at that time. <laughs> so, um, and we did have some early experiments to show that visual spatial attention is indeed affected. And, and later on, I was delighted to see that in, here in Padua, uh, uh, um, um, Andrea, Professor Fakirti has been doing, and his colleagues have been doing some interesting experiments on visual attention, which t tends to, um, um, uh, which seems to be consistent with this idea as well. Uh, now we can come by. Uh, okay, now we can look at what sort of neural mechanisms actually underpin this kind of reading. So, at a at a at a, at a course level, I was telling you how these signals can actually affect it, but how actually do they do that? The clue for that actually came from work on my work on, on macaques, along with my colleagues back in Melbourne in Australia. Uh, we were recording from, from macaques, and we found that these top-down signals, which affect earlier input, uh, which affect earlier areas and affect and gate in, in a way, uh, gate means you know, affect or let in only some information to go through and process this kind of signals. This, this mechanism is actually done in a kind of a cooperative way where um, you, you, there are, uh, you, would have, you would have people have heard about uh, an ECG, uh, where electroencephalogram, where you find all these waves, you know, the record of different frequencies. There could be a very slow wave, right? Um, say at you know, 10 hertz, 10 times a, 10 cycles a second, or it could be a bit faster, right? 20, 20 cycles a second, all right? Um, just like when you, when, you, when, you, when you speak, when you have a low voice, that's a low frequency, or you can have a high voice, that's a high frequency, right? In the same way, you could, um, 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 these kinds of waves are at different frequencies. And now, we discovered that in the monkeys, there are the specific waves, so these kinds of waves, have, in fact, um, sync or synchronize with the area, early areas. The advantage of that is that you imagine if you want to push start a car, you can have each four people push starting the car, the car, you know, and then, then it, if, they, if they do out of sync, each one independently, it's not going to help. Four of them have to be doing together, right? In that way, the higher areas are able to, are in fact, uh, sync number of cells synchronize themselves and they push the early areas into a kind of an oscillatory activity, it kind of wavy activity. And this actually helps uh, to, 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 to pick up the signals coming in very easily because instead of, I mean, actually, I won't go into the details of the biophysics, but actually use what's called a potential of the membrane, which has, which, which has to be raised to a particular level. Raising that is, is quite tough all the way. But if something is already oscillating like that, right, any signals coming in can easily uh, ride on the top of these waves and get into, in, into a kind of a threshold where you can see or hear, whatever. And this seems to be the mechanism by which the, these higher areas we found in the monkey is affecting the earlier areas. Now, it may well be that when, when you are actually reading, when you're going through one or two letters at a time, you actually use these waves, each cycle, each cycle of the wave is actually is able to focus on one or two letters at a time, and then, and then, um, you know, and, and then that that particular area then gets gets processed, and then the next wave comes and process a second a next one or two letters. Of course, there are um, there is um, uh, there are some more details to this, <laughs> uh, but um, this is a general picture. So it may be that and it may be that this kind of top-down oscillatory inputs are necessary to be able to f gradually build up all the letter in the component letters of a word together, right? Um, uh, and I think if you look at the, uh, and we also know the rate at which these oscillations happen, there seems to be a lot of correlation between that and our reading speed. Um, so it, it, uh, so it well could be that this is a mechanism that we have. And in dyslexia, uh, it may be a slower wave because there are so many basic biophysical mechanisms uh, which determine the rate at which you can do this. Right. So um, uh, that may be the basis of a problem in dyslexia. Um, and, and if you have a general temporal process, temporal means a timing problem like that, uh, 
it could affect generally the whole brain, which means it could also affect the, the auditory system, acoustic system, the phonological system, which is necessary to, to convert the, um, the, the actual individual letters to corresponding phonemes and put them together and sound it out. So that could also be slower. So it may not be that the phonological um, uh, problem is the basic problem in dyslexia. It's already starting in the visual system. It could be further worsened by the phonological problem. Um, and, and of course, um, something else we found recently also that um, um, it's not just um, that the, the, the problem could be just a visual attentional problem, but our visual attentional mechanisms themselves can be helped by reading. It's a mutual thing. The basic defect could be the visual attention, but then, then, then these children who are not, who are not finding difficulties with reading would read far less. When you read far less, the children who read a lot, their visual spatial attention, the visual attention mechanisms improve much more, right? So um, that could be another problem, another issue there.